welcome the Misconceptions, a program that is committed to rightly dividing the word of truth. I'm your host, Romul Gusain, and today we have with us Dr. Mark Harwood from Creation Ministries International, who will be discussing with us a very interesting subject, the value of human life. Welcome to the show, Doctor. Thank you very much, Romul. It's great to be here. It's a real pleasure to have you come here and share some of your insights with us. Now, in the last episode, we were able to talk about the origin of mankind. And in this, in this episode, sorry, we're going to be talking about the value of human life. And often when we speak about this subject, people ask things such as, well, does it really matter? I mean, can't we just get on, get, get on with life and, and just live our lives and, and, and try and progress? Why do we have to think about things like that? Well, it's interesting, you know, the, what we think about our origins really affects the way we see ourselves and how we see other people. And so this question of origins, whether we are just the results of random cosmological accidental processes over millions of years, or whether, as the Bible says, we are purposefully created by a loving God, really does matter because it affects how we, we see ourselves. For instance, let me uh, read you some quotes from some evolutionary philosophers who have addressed the question of what is man? And Bertrand Russell said this, a curious accident in a backwater. Peter Atkins from Oxford University said, we're just a bit of slime on the planet. And Stephen Jay Gould, a professor from Harvard said, a fortuitous cosmic afterthought, a tiny little twig on the enormously arborescent bush of life. I think he gets full marks for poetry. <laughs> and Richard Dawkins, a very high profile, outspoken, atheistic professor, he says, we live in a universe which has no design, no purpose, no evil and no good. Nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. Wow, there's not a lot of value there. Well, you'd wonder why these guys get out of bed in the morning. You That's know? right, yes. um, But it, it shows, I guess, a, uh, the logical consequence of thinking through what does it mean if we really are just the result of accidental processes. And Professor William Provine had this to say, let me summarise my views on what modern evolutionary biology tells us loud and clear. There are no gods, no purposes, no goal-directed forces of any kind. There's no life after death. When I die, I am absolutely certain that I'm going to be dead. That's the end for me. There's no ultimate foundation for ethics, no ultimate meaning to life, and no free will for humans either. It's quite depressing, isn't it? Yeah, isn't it? But logical, you see, if you start off with the assumption that we're just a biological accident, yes. then basically what he's saying makes sense. It's true, yeah. So what we think about ourselves, what we believe about our origins, very profoundly affects how we see ourselves. And what are some of the things that the Bible says? Uh, well, the Bible says very different things, doesn't it? <laughs> And uh, for instance, it says uh, in, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. You see, God purposefully and intentionally created each and every single human being, starting, of course, with the original man and woman, Adam and Eve. And so we are the product, products of a loving God who made each and every one of us for a purpose. So we have a reason for living. That makes a, an enormous difference to how we see ourselves. Let me read you uh, another scripture. This is one of the, the Psalms, Psalm 8. And the psalmist says, You made him, meaning mankind, a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honour. Wow. So God sees us as precious, as his creation, and he crowns us with glory and honour. And you get this feeling that you know God is lifting us up Yet when you have a look at this secular world view, it's almost as though they're bringing man down to nothing. That's right. That, and it, that's exactly right, because the evolutionary view makes us just mere accidents. Not only that, it has the effect actually of elevating animals, because it says that animals and man are really very closely related. In fact, that's what Darwin really thought. He thought that mankind had evolved from the apes, and in particular, he thought that the different racial groups, um, as they called them then, of, uh, of people, different people groups, were also ranked, if you like, on some kind of evolutionary hierarchy. And I'd like to read you a quotation from uh, Darwin's uh, own book, The Descent of Man. He Please says do, this, yes. 
At some future period, not very distant as measured by centuries, the civilised races of man will almost certainly exterminate and replace the savage races throughout the world. Interesting, isn't it? Yeah. The break between man and his nearest allies will then be wider instead of, as now, between the Negro or Australian, meaning the Aboriginal, and the gorilla. So what he envisaged was that over time the civilised races, meaning in particular the, the European races, would uh, become more and more elevated and uh, Aboriginal and Negro people would become um, more and more, uh, what well, they would degrade more. In fact, he thought they would actually uh, die out. They were evolutionary dead ends. I mean, that's quite a stark comment there. I mean, that's bordering really. It is quite racist when you listen to something like that, when you, now you're sort of trying to differentiate between someone who that's has right. a darker skin as opposed to someone with a lighter coloured skin. So obviously what we can see here is that uh, the question of origins really does influence what we believe. That's right. That's now, right. And it affects how we see other people. Indeed. So what is the social uh, impact of that? Well, the social impact is really quite profound. Um, for instance, in Australia's own history, we, we've had a very dark period where this kind of thinking became very prevalent. Remember, Darwin published his works, uh, his first book, The Origin of Species, in 1859, and then subsequently, The Descent of Man, um, in the late 1800s. So by the time the uh, early 1900s came, people were really quite uh, imbued with this idea of, uh, of, of racial superiority of Europeans. And uh, in fact, there were uh, people who tried to collect Aboriginal bodies as specimens to send to European museums where they could be put on display, presumably showing the, the evolutionary ascent of man, if you will, from the, the gorilla or the ape all the way to the modern European. That's terrible. Well, it is, and, and we find it quite shocking today. Um, let me just refer to a couple of uh, items here. This is the um, a quote from the deathbed confessions uh, of a man called Cora H. Wills, who was a gold rush immigrant and who became the mayor of Bowen in Queensland. And he confessed about killing an Aboriginal uh, who was later used for display. And uh, here's another one, it's actually on record in the history of Mackay in Queensland, that one overseas collector made a request to the trooper that he shoot a native boy to furnish a complete exhibit of an Australian Aboriginal skeleton, skin oh. and skull. So uh, this is a, a, a terrible thing because they genuinely believed that um, these people were in fact inferior beings, that were not human beings at all. And it was a view that was fueled by this idea that we all descended from the apes or some common ancestor thereof through random unguided processes, evolution in other words. And if you believe this, Th this theory or this thought, obviously if you go and kill someone, well, they're not, they're not really human, they're almost subhuman, so it doesn't really matter. It didn't matter. really matter, yeah. that's right. In fact, in one period, um, some people believed that because Aboriginal people were just one step removed from the apes, that they didn't really even have a soul and there was no point trying to evangelise Aboriginals because they couldn't be saved, wow. uh, which is a, a, a shocking thing. It's now, the, the Bible, tells us that that's absolutely wrong. Mm. It tells us that God made us in his image, that we're precious in his sight, and uh, that all men are of one blood, the Bible says. We're all related. Every culture, every that's society. Right. That's right. And wow. as we discussed previously out of the Tower of Babel, all these different people groups spread out over the, the earth and uh, from the division of languages that happened at the Tower of Babel, that gave rise to all the different ethnic groups that we see today including Aboriginal people, Europeans, Asian people, and so on. And how does this also affect some of our more recent social uh, hotspots, if you like, say it's a topic such as abortion? Well, that's a, a very sensitive issue, of course, but yes. if we believe that we are just, um, just cosmological accidents and like um, William Provine said, when slime, we die, we're it? dead, and oh, okay, all yeah, the other guys yeah, yeah. sort of a bit of slime on the planet, yeah. um, then that does affect how we regard this whole question. Um, 
in fact, somebody once said rather tongue in cheek that if we get rid of spare cats, why shouldn't we get rid of spare kids? Yeah. Um, which is, you know, but the point I think to make here is that if we believe what the Bible says, then, then even a recently conceived child in the womb of its mother is in fact a fully developed human being. Because the Bible says, in fact, that um, indeed in Psalm 51, it says this, Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. So from the Bible's point of view, we are human beings right at the moment of conception. And in fact, that's supported by science. There was a fascinating article in New Scientist a little while ago, and the article said this, let me quote it. DNA technologies indisputably prove that the unborn child is a whole human being from the moment of fertilization, meaning from conception, uh, and that all abortions terminate the life of a human being, and that the unborn child is a separate human patient under the care of modern medicine. Wow. So isn't it interesting? Scientifically, genetically, um, it all makes sense and is consistent with what the Bible says. Now, if we believe in the, the sacredness and the preciousness of human life right from conception, that will give us a very, very different view of uh, how we should approach this whole question of abortion. How many children are aborted? Do you know roughly? Or? Well, in Australia, um, there's something, something somewhere in the order of 100,000 babies are killed in their mother's wombs wow. each year. That is a, a, a tragic number. And all, these, all this life to God is valuable. And I think it's really important to see how God sees this. That's that right. right. Absolutely. Because if we see these things as God sees them, then that radically changes it's how we serious. relate to people and how we engage with these very significant and serious social issues in our world today. Yes. And so someone who perhaps has gone through something like that, I mean, it's quite a sensitive topic. What would you say to them? I mean, I mean, what we're saying here essentially is that it's a wrong thing. It's a bad thing to do that. How is it that they can reshape their thinking now through some of the things that you're saying? I think um, that one of the things we need to understand is that God in his loving grace and mercy provides forgiveness and restoration. Yes. And one of the things which is not told tragically to uh, young mothers who are contemplating abortion is the, um, the devastating emotional and psychological effects that an abortion has on them as, as mothers or mothers-to-be and now no longer if they go through with it. Such as the guilt, or yes, absolutely, and uh, the the. Um, I, I mean, I'm I'm a man. I can't describe these things. I haven't been yes. through it, but um, from what uh, I read and hear and hear people share who've been through this experience, but then who have come to um, to understand that God loves them as a precious personal human being, and they've experienced God's forgiveness, then that is a path towards restoration again and wholeness. Yes. Um, and and I, I would urge people to seek a deeper, more meaningful relationship with God. God, yes. Now, there's been some other things, more recent things in history, in which people have taken this uh, mindset and they've tried to adopt it onto the community, the society. Yes. Perhaps if yes, you can talk have. about some, some examples well, there. Well, there have been a number of different ones. One is um, a thing called eugenics. and. Eugenics is where people uh, seek to try and uh, to sort of hasten the process, if you like, of natural selection or to guide natural selection. Because the thinking is, if you believe in the evolutionary process, that uh, if there was some deficiency in a person, let's say they were in some way uh, disabled physically or intellectually. Or born that way. Uh, yes, yes, that's uh -huh, exactly yes. what I mean. And, and so there's some sort of genetic problem. then. It would be unwise to allow that person to reproduce because those defective genes or whatever caused the problem would could be then be passed on. That's right, yes. passed on okay. and, uh, and, and could filter through the, the rest of the population. And so people become very concerned about it and with um, presumably, I suppose you'd say good intentions, um, believe that we must stop this from happening because it could pollute the human gene pool. And as a consequence, there have been programs in the past, 
uh, called eugenics programs where people with disabilities have been um, in some cases forcibly sterilized to prevent wow. them from reproducing. Now if you take it to an extreme though you can actually have a situation which did arise during the uh, period in Nazi Germany where it was um, considered necessary to actually exterminate people who were considered undesirable. You see there was a, a concept of a life not worth living wow. that came into people's thinking and they would look at someone who was severely disabled and say their life is not worth living so we are justified in, in ending it. Which is a but, terrible thing. I mean, oh, you absolutely. Know, if you're the healthy person, there's no problem. But if you're the person that's born with a disability, well, then someone's going to terminate your life. And so now someone's making this absolutely. choice. Making that decision for you and behalf. failing to recognize this, the sanctity of, yes. of, uh, of that human life. And in essence, someone's playing the role of God. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So it becomes a very confused thing and, and uh, it's like a thin end of a wedge, um, this idea of a, a life not worth living. And it, it, you, uh, it's like the camel that gets his nose in the tent, you know, before long he's completely in it. Yeah. So you can't control this. You can't draw boundaries or, or lines. You can't play God, as, as you put it. Yes. So eugenics uh, is something which now is frowned upon, but interestingly, it's coming to the surface again. People are starting to advocate uh, eugenics-like programs in different uh, different garb and different phraseology. Uh, really, but it's a logical um, consequence, I guess, of the evolutionary way of thought. It's very natural to think that way if you have that mindset or That's that right. belief. That's right. Wow. But when we understand human life as sacred and made in the image of God, we have a very different view about these things. And it's amazing because there are so many examples in the Bible of people that were disabled and God never acted that way. God never said to them, you know, just kill them, cut them off, they're no good to me. And it really shows the value that He has over human life. I mean, He made us. That's right. So we're valuable right. to Him. Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. and uh, for, for someone to turn around and say, well, that life is not valuable, well, they didn't make them. They, they had no part in thinking about them or thinking about the purpose or the will for their life. And I think there's an amazing dynamic there where you can yes. see God's thoughts. You see God's character, his, yes. his nature, his, um, uh, his mercy, his grace, his desire to, uh, to provide in every way for every one of his creation. What that's about right. some, some other things? I mean, uh, this is something that's probably every once a month at least you hear about it in the news, uh, stem cell research. Ah, yes. And you see a lot of Christian groups and they get up in arms about this and they get really upset about Can you explain that? I mean, is it all bad? Is it all evil? Well, there's, there seems to be a moral dilemma. The way it's put forward is um, if stem cell research can be used to help cure someone with, say, a degenerative spinal disease, uh, why would you stand against stem cell research? That's true. So anybody who's against stem cell research is um, against put up life, as, yes, or against health. life, and yeah. against science and progress. But there are two different sorts of stem cells, and it's vital that we understand that difference. Okay. Stem cells, by the way, are undifferentiated cells. The cells in our body um, began at, at conception. There was just two that came together, and they separated. Um, more and more and, uh, and finally you emerged and I emerged and on the way through the cells became the different parts of our body maybe a, an eye or a bone or a liver or some other part of our body so this process of differentiation takes place a stem cell is an undifferentiated cell and there are two sources of undifferentiated cells one is from embryos and the other is from adults or um, mature uh, beings, uh, organisms. So if you take uh, a stem cell and place it into an infected area, say like a damaged spinal cord, then the hope is through medical research and development that it would then start to repair the, the damaged spinal cord. People it would become paralyzed. A, that's and right, and you could recover and so movement on. and all these things. That's a great thing. It is, it yes. is, and, and the whole objective is fantastic, but there are two problems. The first one is that with undifferentiated cells, you have to be um, very careful what actually happens to them. Now, adult stem cells um, can come in, uh, in various forms. Some are called multipotent cells, which means they can take a number of different forms inside the body. So if you wanted to, for instance, uh, undertake a program of um, 
spinal cord regrowth, um, then you would seek um, adult cells uh, of that nature, which could be uh, injected somehow into the spinal cord and start the, the growing process. Okay. Now, adult stem cells uh, are unlikely to suffer from rejection problems, particularly if they're taken from the, the, uh, the same person. Why is that? Um, because it's the same body, the, the okay. cells from the same person's body. If, however, you introduce a cell uh, externally, then you have the risk of rejection problems. Foreign, okay. So foreign body coming in, that's right, and being rejected by the host body. So that's one of the issues. But by far and away, the major one is to harvest an embryonic stem cell, it requires the death of the embryo. Now, remember a little while back, we talked about how life began at conception. Yes. So if you take a human embryo, and harvest a stem cell from it, you actually kill the embryo, which is killing a person. The premeditated I killing see. of another human being is murder. And so it's a very um, highly morally charged issue for that reason. So Christians- and even many secular people are against it for that reason as well, are, isn't Because right? they recognize not, that, yes. that this is, um, yeah, you're actually talking about the, the ending of the life of a human being. Yes. So adult stem cell research, um, not only does it um, greatly reduce the risk of rejection, but interestingly, adult stem cell therapies are now applicable in something like 70 different uh, forms of treatments for diseases now. They're very successful. Okay. Um, there has been essentially no successful treatments developed from embryonic stem cells. Oh, I see. Now, people who insist on embryonic stem cell research seem to have a desire to harvest them, to kill the cells, to, it's, it's like a culture of death, if I could use that phrase. But mm. adult stem cell research is, is fantastic, it's part of our dominion mandate. So whenever we're discussing this issue, we need to make sure we get the adjective correct. Are we talking about embryonic stem cells or adult stem cells. Always make sure people use the adjective. I'm absolutely all for adult stem cell research, but absolutely dead against human embryonic stem cell research. Okay, now thank you very much. That really makes sense. What about other topics such as euthanasia? Well, euthanasia is another very sensitive and uh, challenging area. Um, it's often held up that people should be given the right to be able to terminate their lives, but once again, if we see life as something precious and given by God and made in his image, we would think differently about it. Now, it, it's, I, I don't mean to make light of this and people who are suffering uh, greatly in terminal diseases uh, uh, you know, are in, in desperate straits. But to me, the best outcome is effective palliative care and strong emotional support to hopefully help these people see that even in their time of suffering towards the end of their life, that they are valued and they are precious in God's eyes. If I could just share with you a personal experience, an acquaintance of ours suffered greatly through uh, cancer and finally passed away from that disease. But he said just before he died that the last few months of his suffering, even though they had been very difficult uh, for him, he said, I have become so close to God in my relationship with him and my experience of him. He said, I would not want to swap that. If I had my time again, wow. I would not walk away from this. That's amazing. And so you can see there's another perspective to it. When mm. we are in relationship with our creator, yes. it changes our whole perspective on life. And it's true is that sometimes God has to, you know, it's almost as if we force his hand, you know, and it's, it's not sometimes we get stuck on the, on the gloom and the suffering and how terrible it is, but sometimes God uses pain and suffering as a megaphone to cause us to look up to him. Well, the Bible says that um, in, in all things, God works um, for good. That's you right. Know, all things work together for good for those that love God. Romans 8, 28. Exactly. So it doesn't mean that God sends these things, but yeah. he uses the circumstances for our good. Good. And that's because God can see the bigger picture. He's built that's us right. forever. Absolutely. You know, and so whilst we might suffer here, it's only for a, a certain amount of time. Yet God knows that if he calls us to himself now whilst we're alive, then we'll spend the rest of eternity with him. Yeah. 
Yes. And so the way we, we uh, what we believe uh, about uh, our existence, uh, the value of life, obviously shapes how we see God. Absolutely. Yes. Indeed it does. And, and the Bible gives us a very clear picture of God's character. Uh, for instance, in 1 John 4.16, we read this. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in him. Wow. And then we read from Exodus, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. So we see God's nature and character is, is love, it's compassion. So if we believe, for instance, that we are the results of millions and millions of years of evolution, which involves suffering and death and dead ends and all this sort of thing, then our whole concept of God is affected by that. We would see him as being somehow a capricious God who mm. just watches us live and then die. And so, you know, it's a, a terrible, terrible misrepresentation yeah. of, of God's character. In fact, God's love for us is revealed no more clearly than in the fact that he came in human form in the person of Jesus. He loves us so much that he paid the price for our rebellion against him. And that price was death. Jesus gave his life for us so that we could be in relationship with him, forgiven of our sin. Wow. That is the true picture of how much God really does love us. That's amazing. Thank you once again, Mark, for sharing some of your Thank insights you, with us. I know we've, we've gone through a whole range of subjects, and I'm sure some of the things that you've mentioned now, uh, it's not if someone is going through these things, you're trying to hurt them or upset them. No, but please right. make that clear, yes. That's, that's absolutely right. Um, our heart is to see people come into a full and rich relationship with God, to know that they are loved by Him. Yeah. And I even encourage people to be able to check out, I think the website is www.creation.com. Is That's that right? right. Creation.com. That's the one. Yes. Thank you. We hope and pray that you found this episode to be insightful. Please check out the website www.creation.com and you will be able to read there in a little bit more detail some of those things. Please stay in tune for the very next episode and until then, goodbye.